Hey, welcome. Right after lunch, I see you're all excited. Your tummies are filled. If you went to neuroscience, I recognize that 10% of your brain's energy is now in your tummy. So it's going to be a Lego kind of day, all right? So Rich has been successfully delivering change for over 25 years. His consulting practice has seen him work with organizations across all parts of the globe. His legacy includes developing the change delivery model for UK government and being a founding member of the Association of Change Management Professionals, where he was the founding president of the Toronto chapter for six years. He has a master's in change management and is a certified Lego series play facilitator and workshop designer. He is also certified, of course, in project management, process improvement, facilitation, HR coaching, counseling, and if you really get lost, psychotherapy. His presentation delivery is known for its passion and direct challenges to the audience, and he enjoys the opportunity to disrupt traditional thinking. Stay at a Lego table. Bring humor to the learning space and enable curiosity to take control of the change space for everyone. It is with my great honor and pleasure that I introduce Rich Batchelor. Whoa, thank you. All right, so I'm not a stage person, so I'm going to be down with you guys as we go through this session. So I thought, first of all, I'm going to share with you the three challenges of a presenter that has to do a session straight after lunch. <laughs> first challenge, personally, making sure none of my lunch lands down my front, or any other part of my anatomy for that matter. Second challenge is making sure that none of you fall asleep because of your carbohydrate challenge and all the rest of the energy that you've consumed. But more importantly, the third challenge of coming back in the afternoon. People start thinking towards the end of the day once they've done lunch. The psychology starts to focus, okay, done the morning now, let's start focusing on how soon can I get away from this place and get on to enjoy stuff this afternoon. So I'm gonna try and take you through things as quickly as I can. We're gonna keep things punchy because we've only got a short time. And as everybody got stuck on the bridge trying to come across, that's chopped about three or four minutes off us. But, you know, we'll keep going. So, I actually created this session around the VUCA phrase. And I'll share with you what VUCA means in a moment. But I find a lot of organizations, a lot of people, are using this VUCA statement without really understanding what it means. There's kind of like this, oh, yeah, yeah, that's because we're in a VUCA world. That's because, you know, everything's disruptive. You know, that's just what we're dealing with. And what I really wanted to do was pull it apart for you guys. At a beginner level, at a basics level, we're not here to judge knowledge levels on the whole thing. We're here to take it back to first principles and get you understanding what we mean by VUCA. Because when you truly understand what we mean by VUCA, then you can do something about it. I'll be giving you a bit of guidance on that side of thing as we go through. Also, we're going to be doing a lot of stuff with Lego. So if you are at a table without Lego, this is your moment to politely move into a table with Lego. It's because there is no escaping. Everybody will be touching Lego bricks today. If you don't touch Lego bricks, I will know. I have this sense. Okay, so let's get things started. What the heck is VUCA? So VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Sometimes there's various versions of these words, you know, ambiguous rather than ambiguity, but the core of the words are the same thing. And its origins go back to US military in 1987, trying to understand the new style of warfare and the nature of the environment in which military combat was taking place. But it was only really 2002 that it started to get to a higher prominence, and people started to mention the word for the first time outside of that military little bubble, and people started to use it as a term to describe organizations and the situations that were happening in organizations. But why did they say this? Well, they said this because this thing started to come about called disruptive change. So all of us who have been experiencing any change management activity in our lives, and trust me, yes, when CJ said over 25 years, I've been doing this game for 27 years now. 
I started that high. So, um, but disruptive change during the 2000s started to be seen. And disruptive change is not planned change. This is change that comes about because it just happened. All sorts of circumstance, all sorts of situations just caused things to happen. And I'm sure we've had that where even being here over the last few days, something's happened to you and you're going, oh, I wasn't expecting that. That was a disruptive change to your situation. So they started to talk about disruptive change as being that change that had an impact. But people weren't too sure what was happening with it. It was rippling out to people and making people feel differently about things. And VUCA came out of the military into the more traditional, should we call it civil workplace, and started to be used to describe the impact of this disruptive change. So I'm going to take you through each of these elements of VUCA, starting with volatility, and help you understand a little bit about what these mean, so you can actually recognize these and recognize how it feels. And the feeling bit is where the Lego comes in. Not just because you'll be using your hands with Lego, but we'll be doing exercises as we go through quite rapidly that will help you experience Lego. OK, what is happening when someone or something is volatile? Well, when we get volatile, we tend to get sort of wound up and angry and shouty and, you know, that whole piece comes up. We're actually being quite exposing. And this means that when we talk about volatility, we're actually bringing our vulnerability up to the forefront. Now, I'm not here to talk about vulnerability. There's somebody who's much more capable of doing that than I am. And I do recommend, if you don't know this woman and you don't know her work, apart from which stone have you been hiding under for the last few years, you go and look up. But that feeling that you have of being vulnerable is exactly the same emotions you have when you experience being volatile. So, we're going to start with some Lego. And I'm going to get you to experience volatility using Lego. So make sure you're at a table with Lego. No hiding in the back corners. Move in. Move in. Trust me, you don't want my wrath. So make sure you're at a table with Lego. If you're on your own at a table, try and get with other people, because, you know, we're meant to be socializing here a little bit as well. So I want each person at the table to take four or five pieces of Lego out of the pile that's in the center of their table. So this is where you get to feel things. <laughs> Just four or five. If you need to take a sixth piece, you can take a sixth piece. I'm not going to be counting that rapidly. If you need more Lego bricks, there's a spare set here. There's also a bag here. Trust me, I take bags of Lego with me. So while you're taking your Lego bricks, I want to see a show of hands in the room. Is there anybody in this room who has never played with Lego? Awesome. I'm sure there's something I can reflect on that, but I'm not going to at this moment in time. Sometimes when I do this with big groups, we have some people who've actually never experienced Lego. I know that sounds strange, but you get some people who've never experienced Lego. So for those people, I have to identify that everybody else in the room is their technical support, because they will be helping them to fit the books together. So let's go through a quick exercise to get you doing volatility. So of those bricks you have in front of you, I want you to find your smallest brick. And I want that smallest brick to be held up between your finger and thumb in front of you. Now I want you to take the next smallest brick that you have in front of you and attach it to that one, any way you can. And then hold it out. And then take the third one that's third shortest, and so on, so that the last piece, the fourth or fifth piece that you have, is the longest piece. Doesn't matter what it looks like. I'm not judging things for art competitions here. 
There's no engineering degrees required. Do whatever works for you. And when you've created these, I want you, still holding that first piece between your finger and thumb, to stretch your arm out into the middle of the table, holding this over the center as far as you can. Now I'm going to test you and count 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Anybody get shaky arm syndrome? A few shaky arms, a few wobbles. How safe did that piece feel out at that distance? Were you concerned about anything dropping? Were you concerned about things coming off? Were you unsure whether it was going to hold it together? I'm not talking mentally here. That's a whole other story. Physically holding it together. You've just felt something being volatile in your hands. That feeling of not knowing what was going to happen, how that overstretched, that sort of insecurity of the strength of that, that's volatility. So now you know what volatility feels like, what volatility looks like to a certain extent. Let's move on. Uncertainty. What is uncertain for you today, tomorrow, always? There's one very simple answer to this one. Anybody know? Anybody like to guess? The future. The future is our biggest level of uncertainty. We can try our darndest to try and predict the future, but we never know what it's going to be. And this is the whole point when we talk about uncertainty. We're never quite sure which way things are going to go, what's going to happen next. So I'm going to take you into your next Lego activity for uncertainty. So you're going to need to kind of pair up for this one. So try and pair up at your tables, if you can. Now, one person in each pair, and we're going to do two cycles, so both sides of the pair get this experience. Don't worry. Nobody's going to miss out. We'll have no FOMO moments here going on. So in pairs, I want one person to be the target and one person to be, what should we call them? We'll call them the activist. So decide between the two of you who's going to be target and who's going to be activist. Come on, quick, quick. Quick, quick, quick. Done. All right, you've decided. If you haven't decided, you have now. Okay. Target. You are going to take two pieces of Lego that look different. And you are going to put one in each hand and cover it over and hold it tight. So just place each piece in each hand and close your hands on it. And then you are going to hold these out to the activist. And the activist is going to choose one, but not yet. I know you are so keen to choose. I want the activist to just pause for a moment and let their hand hover over one hand and the other. Maybe think. Which one do they want? Do they want to go left hand or right hand? Right hand or left hand? Think about which way you're going to go. Consider yourself. There's going to be meaning behind this. There's a reason for which piece you're going to choose here. You've got to think about this. And now you can choose one. And let the uh, person, the target, open their hand and show you what you've chosen. Now, surprise, no, 
Okay, so the target experienced uncertainty then. You didn't know which hand was going to be chosen. You were experiencing uncertainty of choice. And that's typically where uncertainty comes in, where there are alternative choices and you're not sure how to deal with them. Now, let's flip it round, but I'm not going to do activist and target this time. I'm going to do store person and warehouse. So the person who was the activist last time is now going to be the warehouse. And I just want them to take a scoop of Lego up off the table. Doesn't matter, six, seven, however many pages you want, uh, books you want. Just take a few, hold them either in one hand or two, and hold them out to the other person. So the stores person is going to select what they want to take from that other hand. So just hold them open and show them all the bricks. So choose one of those many bricks that you see in front of you. That unpredictability of knowing which brick that person was going to choose is uncertainty. That experience that you felt there, obviously the other way around this time, is uncertainty. So now you've experienced uncertainty. So we're two down, two to go. And time is okay. Now we're going to go into complexity. So before we jump into the Lego stuff, I want to give you a little bit of insight on complexity. Because complexity is going to get busy in this room. Because it's going to be complex. But what is complex to you? Give me some examples of real world things that you call complex. Human body. Well, interesting one. Maybe the human mind. Mm. Maybe. Chess. That's an interesting one. I'll come to that in a moment. Drug development? Drug development? <laughs> <laughs> wh wh which, which bureaucratic forms were you talking about then? OK, I want to just pause for a moment and talk about the difference between complicated and complex. Now, for those of you that don't recognize my accent, my accent is Welsh, not English. Apologies to anybody in the room who's English, but you make sure you don't associate. <laughs> um, but the actual, there's an actual guy called Dave Snowden who worked for IBM and came up with this framework. And anybody who's had exposure to agile frameworks and agile working might have come across this because it's used a lot. And it's actually called the Kenevin framework. And Kenevin is a Welsh word. Yes, Wales has its own language. And it's a Welsh word for habitat or home or abode or place where you live normally and naturally. And he talked about this in terms of the experience in organizations and how organizations need to understand the difference between the level of control situations have. Where the most controlled situation is downright obvious because you know everything that's going to happen in it. But when you have a number of activities or a number of things, but you know, even if they are a huge amount, the possible outcomes, which is where I challenge the chess thing, because some people say, well, there is a finite number of chess moves and chess plays and all that, but other people say, no, 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 we haven't found them all yet. So it kind of overlaps a little bit on this piece. Um, and again, for the human body, some people would argue, well, we know what's in the human body. Other people would say, well, we only know what we can see that's in the human body at the moment. So there's a little bit of challenge on that front. But typically, a complicated space is a space with multiple potential outcomes, but they are all known. It's just that planned choice, and there's only a finite amount. When we talk about complexity, 
there are infinite number of potential outcomes and we don't know what they are. We can't necessarily predict. All we can predict is that infinity of outcomes. And then when everything goes to pot, it's chaos. So it's chaotic when we don't know anything about the inputs, the outputs, and who's involved in everything, and it's just, you know, total disorganization. So, back to the Lego. And I'm going to get you to experience complicated, then I'm going to get you to experience complex, just because sometimes that helps you to understand this by doing it practically. So I want you to take one piece of Lego in your hand, left or right hand, doesn't matter which, and I want you to stand up and take that piece of Lego to the table next to you. Left, right, behind, in front, doesn't matter. Take it and put it on the pile of the table next to you. And while you're doing this, just look around the room at the amount of movement that's going on with how many people are up and out and moving around. So once you've done that, then you can go back to your seat where you came from and return. So what you've just done is a complicated movement. There was a lot of movement going on there, a lot of people doing things at the same time. But there was a predictability about where it was going to go. You only had three or four options for the table next to you, apart from a couple of rebels who were going to do their own thing in the room anyway. So, you know, there's always that case. Now I'm going to ask you to do something complex. Take a piece of Lego and go and put it on any table. And while you're doing this, have a look around at the amount of movement again. And then come back to your original seat. It takes a little longer to re resettle after a complex situation than a complicated one. It's a bit further navigation going on there. And this is how your brain responds as well. But, well, when it's working. Um, but what you experienced then was complex because there was no predictability to the outcome of your activity. We, could, we knew the essence, the driver for it, but I didn't know which table you were going to put a piece of Lego on. That was up to you. You were the only person who had some predictability about that. Unless you were being vocal and going, right, I'm going to go as far away as I can and go there. Which, again, can help. And I'll talk before we finish today on some quick tips on dealing with each of these elements. But I wanted to make sure that I explained them all to you first. So that's complexity. Multiple unknown outcomes. What about ambiguity? What about when something is ambiguous? So I always like to throw this image up there and kind of get people going, so can you see the old woman? Or can you see the young lady? Or can you see both? And depending on which way your eyes are working, you flip between the both of them. But we often have a series of words associated with ambiguity of like lack of clarity, dubious response, unsure, you know, indefinite, these kinds of words, because we're not really sure what it is. It's something, and we can verify that it is something. But how we might choose to label or describe or put some sort of explanation on it is a challenge. So, back to the Lego. So this is where you're going to do your biggest Lego work today. Understanding ambiguity. You're going to have to work together as a table. Now, I think all the tables with Lego have got like a base plate type Lego piece on there. If you haven't, then you might have to just be a little bit 
sort of generous with what the situation is. But you're going to work together to build something using as many of the pieces that are on your table as possible. I don't care what you build. It's your choice. But I want to give you, mm, how are we doing for time? Let's see. We'll give you four minutes to go and build something together, whether there's two of you or six of you or eight of you on a table. Build something, whatever you can build out of all those bricks together. Oh, and by the way, I will be timing these four minutes and reminding you as the time disappears. Oh. They've given me a four minutes there. So don't be afraid to use all your pieces that you collected, but as much as you can. As many as you can. There's definitely some frustrated engineers in the room. Or maybe architects. So less than two minutes left. She only ends up with one not being used. Less than a minute. If you finish before the time runs out, you can quite comfortably sit back and enjoy your creation in front of you. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Stop building, hands away. Leave what you've done in the center of your table. What you've got is what you've got. And that's good. It's fine. Don't worry, I'm not going to go into psychoanalyze what you've built. We're not here for that today. I probably haven't got enough time actually looking at some of the creations around the room. But I want you to now experience 
ambiguity. So in your table, I want you on an individual basis to take it in turns describing your own unique interpretation of what you've built. Now, even though you built things together, you each had a contributing part, I hope, even if it was only a few people that were supervisor specials. I saw a lot of pointing fingers, put that there, put that there, that's fine, that's okay. That's perfectly fine. But I want one person, maybe the furthest person, I don't know, my right, your left, on each table to start by just pulling the building, creation, whatever it is, a little bit towards them and telling the rest of the table what it is, what their interpretation is of what they've built. And you might want to reference in your interpretation how certain things on that creation mean certain things to you. You might have shapes or colors or combinations that mean something to you. So I'm going to give you about five minutes to work your way around as many people as you can on your table. Some tables we won't get to everybody. So the people who are on my left, on the right, are going, yes, but that's fine. We'll try and get around as many as we can. So I want you to start now. So take it to one side. Person that's furthest to the, your left. So about four minutes left. There's some great storytelling going on around the room. I think we should be capturing these stories for a published book. So two and a half minutes left. So make sure you're moving around your table so that as many people as possible can get an opportunity to share their own personal interpretation of what's been built. So if you want a memory marker of this session, this is also your chance to take some photographs because this has been your expert build out of all the things you've done with Lego. So this has been your piece de resistance.
Just a bit over a minute left. And of course, feel free to post on the app and all that sort of stuff. If you, if you feel like showing your volatility and vulnerability. So just about a minute left. The room is starting to go a bit silent, so I'm, I'm sensing that most tables have had their full round. Any tables need any more time? Are we good? Yep, we're good. Okay. I'm conscious of time. So, first of all, as you talked and did each different description, that was ambiguity that you were experiencing. There was an ambiguity about what you built because it had multiple interpretations. There was multiple ways that could be seen depending on whose eyes and whose interpretation, even whose mind was analyzing it. And that ambiguity is something that we often forget about when we're dealing with change because the human brain can be very ambiguous. You cannot predict how people are going to respond to every situation. All you can do is reflect on how they previously responded to maybe a similar situation and anticipate the same thing again. But it may not be the case. So when we're talking about this whole disruptive change in VUCA world, we're talking about change that has that unpredictability about it that change that we're needing to deal with because it's fluid, it's not fixed. Now, we haven't got another two hours to go through, although I wish we did, but I just wanna give you some quick snippets to go away with on how to actually deal with each of these elements. So first of all, you need to have any organization that you're working with that is either using the VUCA word or experiencing VUCA to have consistency in how you understand VUCA. Now, you may choose to use something like one of these Lego activities. There's some fantastic videos on YouTube that I can recommend to you if you're interested as well, that give people four or five minute session just so you've got the same baseline. Because so many organizations have ambiguity in the interpretation of ambiguity. It's true. So make sure you start with the same base level of understanding. When we're talking about volatility and we're talking about vulnerability, the biggest saving grace for that is developing organizational and individual resilience and actually working with people so that they do not respond so volatile is about making sure that they have higher levels of resilience. When we're talking about uncertainty and complexity, I'll actually combine those two together. And part of that is because complexity is all about the uncertainty of the activity that will come out. But I'm going to mention that A word for this, agile. But I'm not talking big A agile. I'm talking little A agile. I'm talking mindsets, cultural agility organizational or business agility, the ability to be adaptive, flexible, nimble, whatever other words you want to use to describe this. I'm not talking about safe process certification agile. I'm talking about that flexibility. When you have people who can bend and flex with situations, they are comfortable with uncertainty and they're comfortable with complexity. And then finally, ambiguity. For ambiguity, there's one simple competence that everybody needs to unleash, and that's curiosity. You need to be willing to ask questions, to understand what the person or the situation actually means, and not get caught with the ambiguity 
of making assumptions. I'm a big proponent for curiosity being encouraged in organizations. I've done lots of work and I could talk to people offline about this if you want to. I've got whole competency frameworks in curiosity that I've developed. But that curiosity piece is really, really important because having the confidence to question a situation stops you suffering with ambiguous situations. Because as humans, we like to be able to put some fixed points on what we're dealing with. You can only do that if you ask questions about that situation. So, disruptive change is VUCA. And now we all know how to hopefully understand it. And even if we can't avoid it, at least you feel that you can have some sense of taming it. Thank you. That's it. We're done. Thank you. That's all my details. Always happy. Anybody wants to get in touch with me, I can talk to anybody and everybody forever. And I'll also be around at the front here for the next five minutes. Big, big ask of everybody, though. Can you please dismantle the bricks that you've built? So last chance for any photos and bring your bricks to the front to go in the set. Oh, you have the set? You got it got? Oh, CJ has it covered. What more can I ask? All right, thank you. <laughs>